As I stated at the end of part one, the events leading up to the Battle of Nogales, they're murky at best. Somewhere in the National Archives of both countries, there could be misplaced or forgotten documents that can shed light on the exact reason why this unnecessary and deadly incident took place. Now to be sure, racism, prejudice, national pride, suspicion of espionage and patriotism were a major factor in creating this incident, as well as Mexican-American relations over the previous 80 years that it wasn't that great. Now each side had their own opinion about how the battle started, and that's fine. However, historians do need to dig a little bit deeper by evaluating evidence, looking for bias and checking facts. Sometimes that can be almost impossible due to the passing of time, memories fading of the participants, or documents and diaries that have not been found yet that could utilize, be utilized to shed more light on a particular event. Now, a good example of this is Private Clint, the soldier who allegedly fired the first shot. Reports stated he fired a warning shot into the air. The Mexican carpenter Zeferino Gil Lamadrid, who crossed the border without having his package inspected, dropped to the ground. People assumed Zeferino Gil Lamadrid was killed and the battle erupted. Private Clint was allegedly killed in the battle, but in fact he returned home and told a story about a train trying to run the border with Mexican troops and German spies. Discrepancies like this should be researched and either confirmed or irrefut irrefutably debunked, but that takes time and money, neither of which I have a lot of. Now, Zeferino Lamadrid, a carpenter, had passed through the railroad custom stations in Nogales, Arizona at about 4.10 p.m. He was carrying a large parcel and, parcel, and for whatever reason, he did not stop to have the parcel inspected by the U.S. Customs agent, Arthur G. Barber. Now, Barber, seeing Lamadrid pass through Customs House without stopping for an inspection of the package, ordered him to stop and return for an inspection. By that time, Lamadrid had crossed over to Mexican territory. Now, the Mexican border guard, Francisco Gallegos, directed Lamadrid to ignore the U.S. official and stay in Mexico. It's at this point that the triggering event comes into question. Who fired that first shot? Was it William Clint or was it his buddy who was shot dead according to Private Clint? As I stated in my Battle of Nogales Part 1 video, Private Clint related the events that day to his grandniece Mary Lee McClendon Becker. Now you can find that at the website cactus35.com. Now she posted her recollections of what Clint said happened that day. I'll repeat it here for those who didn't see Part 1. He was guarding the border between the United States and Mexico. I don't remember him telling us where it was. He said that he was at a train depot slash telegraph office. They saw a train coming up towards the border with what appeared to be the whole Mexican army. Now the Mexican military was trying to run the border in order to get two German agents who were carrying counterfeit U.S. currency across the border. Bill stated that the Mexican shot his buddy dead and that when he saw his friend lying dead, he just went berserk, turned on the approaching Mexican army, and started shooting them. Now, Bill was struck by bullets again and again. He was shot in the arm and the palm, so he had a crippled left hand for life after that. Now, in all other accounts of the incident, Private Clint sent a warning shot into the air to get Lam Madrid to return to the U.S. side of the border. Lam Madrid, being no fool, drops to the ground for self-preservation. Mexican border guard Francisco Gallegos opened fire on Private Clint. If in fact it was Private Clint, U.S. Customs Inspector, seeing the alleged Private Clint go down, returns fire and kills the Mexican Custom Guard, Gallegos, and Andre Sassina. If the narrative is accurate, a maximum of 10 shots fired in a matter of minutes or two, a minute or two, one by the Army Private, one to three shots by Francis Gallegos, and possibly six shots from Barber. Was that enough to cause the citizens of Sonora, Mexico to grab their guns and start shooting? across the border, or was Private Clint's version more likely to be the triggering event? Now, I'm not accusing Clint or anybody involved in this incident of lying. It's just the facts are not that cut and dry. Now, could both governments have ordered a whitewash of the situation due to the war and the international relations? Now, under President Wilson, anybody, newspaper, political group, or an individual citizen could be arrested and jailed for saying anything against the U.S. government 
and the war effort. Who's to know what actually started the battle? There might be documents in the U.S. archives or the Mexican archives that would shed new light on how this battle actually started. Whatever the reason, the tensions along the border were at a boiling point, just waiting for any reason to shoot. So, the first shots were fired. Colonel H.B. Warfield wrote in his book, 10th Cavalry Border Fight, about the Battle of Nogales, which is quoted in Cacti35.com. Nogales, Sonora of 1918 was under control of a Mexican federal garrison. The local situation was complicated by agitations aroused to German agents and accompanying rising dislike for the U.S. The Gringos. Now, on the American side, the people were on the alert. Most householders had a Winchester or other weapons in, the, in a convenient location. On the Mexican side of the border, feelings were similar. According to the U.S. Army investigation, which Carlos Francisco Pata quoted on his website, nomadicborders.com, Mexican custom employees with a number of irresponsible civilians had begun organizing against the U.S. since the December 31, 1917, killing of customs inspector Francisco Mercado. Now some Mexican customs inspectors and supportive civilians decided that if there were any more trouble on the line, all should get arms and proceed immediately to the line for the purpose of avenging themselves on the Americans. Leading up to the battle, U.S. troops had crossed the border on several occasions going after contraband and alleged spies. Now the Mexican government and the population of Sonora, Mexico we're not happy about this. Now, talk about a powder keg and everyone running around with a lit match looking for the fuse. The U.S. Army report is one-sided. I understand that. However, it is unusual for one side to be completely at fault and the other side completely innocent. How much of the Army intelligence report is actual fact and how much is supposition? And did that report, or part of it, stoke the tensions among the citizens and the soldiers of Nogales, Arizona? Now, to add to the tension, the federal Mexican forces had dug trenches in the hillsides to set up a defense against rebel Mexican forces who might try to take back the town. In response to the violence along the border, due to the Mexican Revolution, the U.S. Army was sent to the border to protect American civilians and U.S. territorial integrity. Now stationed in Nogales was the 35th Infantry Division and the 10th Cavalry. Now when the shooting started at the border crossing, Colonel H.B. Warfield wrote a witness named Frank Eames phoned the 35th Guard Detail which was stationed at the West Coast Company warehouse and reported the fight. Now another civilian witness, Otto Meyer, jumped into his truck and went to the warehouse to get help. Now in his testimony to the Senate subcommittee of the Committee on Foreign Relations, this was on Wednesday, February 11, 1920, Lieutenant Colonel Herman related the battle. Colonel Herman and his wife were heading into Nogales at approximately 4.20, 10 minutes after the shooting started at the border crossing, and about two miles from his camp. He saw a truck headed out towards Camp Little at an excessive rate of speed. He stopped the truck and discovered from the driver, and by hearing firing, when the noise of the truck ceased, that the American troops along the line, known as the Line Guard, and Mexicans crossed the international line were engaged in, a, in rifle fire in the vicinity of the railroad station in Nogales, Arizona. Colonel Herman stated he had anticipated something of this nature would happen. He let the truck go, which was driven by Meyer. Herman went to the nearest building, the Nogales Waterworks, with a phone. He called his headquarters and then ordered the 10th Cavalry to arms. He then called the sub-district commander and ordered the men of the 35th Infantry to report to him at the railroad station. In the meantime, Corporal Roy V. Morledge of uh, Troop A, 10th Cavalry, he was also in Nogales when the shooting started. He wrote, 
I happened to be downtown near the depot when I heard some rifle shots and then more. I saw them carrying a wounded soldier at Territorial, I'm sorry, International Street. Motor transport was scarce in those days, but I had a good horse. I sped over the hills a couple of miles to camp. On the way, I passed Lieutenant Colonel Herman in his car. He had already gotten some news and told me to go and on and get my troops out and notify Troop C and Troop F. In the meantime, Mr. Meyer, Mayor, had picked up Lieutenant Fanning and a group of soldiers at the West Coast Company warehouse. Now, upon arriving on the scene along International Ave, Fanning and his soldiers saw volley fire coming from the building on the Mexican side. The building's on the Mexican side. Now, by the time Colonel Herman had arrived back in town with his squadron of cavalry, after reconnoitering the situation, Herman began to deploy his troops. Colonel Herman related the events uh, of the battle in his Senate testimony. I was moving very fast. Firing was general from a sharp knoll or a hill just south of Nogales, Arizona, on the Mexican side, and along International Ave. From the buildings, alleyways, and doorways of the houses on the Mexican side. This extended westward along International Line. I found that a considerable force of Mexicans were located in and about the freight warehouse, railroad depot, and lines of freight cars drawn diagonally across the wide street. I also found considerable forces of Mexicans entrenched on a hill on a high hill commanding Nogales, Arizona, and to the southwest across International Line. I found Mexicans in the windows of the House of General Obergon firing at our troops. I then made the necessary disposition of my men. Captain Murray B. Mollage of Troop A, 10th Cavalry, had gathered his men as well as CNF troops of the 10th Cavalry. He led his men back to town down Morley Ave and deployed along the firing line as ordered by Colonel Herman. Colonel Herman deployed Captain Hungerford and C Troop along with support from the 35th Infantry at the base of Reservoir Hill. He deployed Captain Morledge and Company A, 10th Cav, to deploy along International Ave. Colonel Herman then ordered Captain Carone and Troop F of the 10th Cavalry to deploy to the right of Captain Morledge across the railroad tracks in by the depot. Now firing had been going on for about 30 minutes by the time Colonel Herman had his troops deployed. Now as he stated in his testimony, before the night committee, I found no cessation of firing and apparently no chance to get anywhere with that kind of an arrangement. So I began to advance my line across international boundary. <music> Captain Hungerford was instructed to clear the commanding position to the southeast of town held by the Mexicans, entrenched on Reservoir Hill. Captain Hunger Hungerford advanced his force up Reservoir Hill down into the cleft across the line in the center of his line. Colonel Herman gave orders for Captain Morledge and Troop A of 10th Cavalry to advance across International Ave with instructions to clear the houses and drive all male Mexicans to the south that didn't have to be shot and to be careful that no women or children were injured. Now Colonel Herman ordered his troop to advance across the border, Captain Karen's objective was to occupy the Calm Hill. That troop began became heavily engaged as they advanced. Captain Karan recalled the Mexicans were on the flat house tops and the hills giving us a heavy fire. And we returned it. Now Captain Karan was taking cover behind a telephone pole with his first sergeant Thomas Jordan when he was hit in the right arm below the elbow. Sergeant Jordan picked him up and carried him back out of range of of fire. First Sergeant Jordan then took command of the troop. Now during this advance, Lieutenant L.W. Loftus was struck by a bullet and killed, and Corporal Bonnie Lotz was also fatally shot. Morledge related the events of the skirmish as his troops deployed. Not far along before we got a lot of fire. There was so much it was hard to tell where it was coming from. Also it seemed as though everybody in Nogales was shooting from the windows towards the border. Reaching the line in spite of the fire, we dashed into a building on the Mexican side without resistance, but bullets from up on the hillside were hitting the place. We ran forward into another connecting building. Now it was the Concordia Club. In there were some frightened senoritas wearing kimonos. I got a laugh when one of them spoke to a trooper saying, Sergeant Jackson, 
Are we all glad to see you? But we did not have time to tarry for the soldier to his alibi, to alibi his acquaintanceship. Morlich and his troops made it to the back of the first block of houses, but could do nothing further until Captain Curran and his troops secured Tidcombe Hill. Now, during eight troops advanced across International Ave, Corporal A. L. Whitworth was hit in the groin and dropped in front of a house. Two citizens of Nogales, Mrs. Emma Budge and Mrs. Jones, exposing themselves to hostile gunfire, ran out and dragged Whitworth to safety. Captain Morley sent a message to Colonel Herman stating they were stalled and were waiting for Captain Curran and his men to take Titcom Hill. Colonel Herman ordered us to the top of the hill. Up we went in waves of a squad at a time, firing at Mexicans off to one side. We took a position near some old buildings and a barricade. Down below were the Mexican depot and buildings. From there they were firing towards the American town and some probably just hiding. They also started replying to our action. I hope we only hit those who were shooting, but there are a lot of bodies lying around. All of a sudden someone saw a long pole with the sheet tied tied on being waved from the top of the Mexican customs house down below. At this point, Colonel Herman moved forward. He crossed International Ave to ascertain the situation for himself. Now, as he crossed International Ave, a Mexican rifleman on the second floor of one of the buildings on the Mexican side of International Ave spotted Colonel Herman in the open. Seeing an easy target, the Mexican rifleman opened fire on Herman and hit him in the thigh. Now, meanwhile, on Reservoir Hill, Company F and the thir uh, 35th Infantry in support of Troop C was also engaging Mexican forces. Now, during this forward dash, Captain Hungerford was shot through the heart and instantly killed. First Sergeant James T. Penny then took command of Troop C. Subsequently, he received a special commendation for his initiative and the handling of the troopers. F Company and C Troop were able to clear the hill of Mexican forces. Besides the death of Captain Hungerford, a private from Company F was hit and fell just across the street from the home of Colonel A.T. Byrd. June Reed, a niece of the Byrds and Miss O'Daly, ran out the back and called to the man. He crawled across the street and was helped into the house. Now Sergeant Victor Arana, also with the 35th Infantry, was wounded as well. It was at this point the Private First Class, James Flavin of the Quartermaster Corps, seeing his buddies being gunned down, immediately jumped into action. Using his truck, he was able to gather up the wounded and bring them to safety. Now for his actions, he was awarded the Distinguished Service Cross, the second highest military award for extraordinary heroism in battle that this country can give, the first being the Medal of Honor. Now, Private Flavin's citation reads, Distinguished Service Cross is presented to James Flavin, last full name is Lavery, Private First Class U.S. Army for extraordinary heroism in action during an engagement with hostile Mexicans at Nogales, Arizona, and Nogales, Sonora, Mexico, on the 27th of August, 1918. Private Flavin Lavery braving the heaviest of fire repeatedly into the zone of fire with his motor truck and carried wounded men to places of safety, thereby saving the lives of several soldiers. General Order No. 9, War Department, 1923. His hometown was New York, New York. Now, Private Flavian Laverty would not be the only U.S. Uh, soldier recognized for gallantry that day. First Lieutenant Oliver Fanning was in charge of about 15 to 20 enlisted men from H Company, the 35th Infantry, doing guard duty along the international border. They were stationed at the West Coast Company warehouse when the shooting started. Now, as he told his son in a letter he wrote in 1972, which was posted on the website cacti35th.com, these men were the real heroes. They were not more than 15 or 20 of them. They were there when the fighting started, and they were there when it ended, lest those who were killed or wounded. For his actions, while in command of his 15 to 20 men, Lieutenant Flavin was awarded the Distinguished Service Cross as well. Now, his citation reads, Distinguished Service Cross is presented to Oliver W. Fanning, 1st Lieutenant, U.S. Army, 
for extraordinary heroism in action in an engagement with hostile Mexicans at Nogales, Arizona on August 27, 1918, while commanding the Guard, 35th U.S. Infantry. In other words, Lieutenant Fanning and his men were the only U.S. troops at the border when the whole Mexican side of International Ave erupted with gunfire. Now, for approximately 20 minutes, Lieutenant Fannin and his men held off the overwhelming Mexican forces. They could have retreated, but Lieutenant Fannin gave the orders to stay and fight. Lieutenant Fannin's actions that day so impressed the citizens of Nogales that they wrote a testimonial for Fannin. Quote, the undersigned citizens of Nogales, Arizona take this method of giving expression to our appreciation of the gallantry and bravery of Lieutenant Oliver Fannin of the 35th Regiment of Infantry USA and the men on guard duty at the international boundary at Nogales, Arizona on Tuesday, August 27, 1918, upon which momentous occasion Lieutenant Fanning was the officer of the guard. At the very beginning of the hostile demonstration, Lieutenant Fannin hurried to the boundary of the reserve guard, taking position he stood off the attack until the garrison could be brought to the line and take up their work. The losses of his men, which were a large percentage of all the losses, show the bravery and gallantry of the little force commanded by the heroic officer through all the fight. With his men firing from prone positions, Lieutenant Fanning stood erect, encouraging his men, directing their fire, and contributing to the effectiveness of their work. Their loss of two killed and four wounded presented the perilous position then occupied and held. In presenting this testimonial, we do so without solicitation to present our appreciation and admiration of a gallant officer and brave men." End quote. Now, Lieutenant William Scott of the 10th Cavalry was riding a motorcycle into town on business when he heard the firing. Now, he took a familiar back track for the high ground above the Sonora town, arriving close to the place he basically hid the motorcycle and then crept to the brow of the hill overlooking the scene of the conflict. He was armed with a 45 uh, pistol, but he was also armed with a new Winchester rifle. Now, from his lone position, he began picking off snipers from the rooftops below. During the height of the fighting that one very brave man tried to stop the bloodshed. As the violence escalated, the mayor of Nogales, Sonora, Felix B. Penzola, Penzola, sought to stop the shooting. The 53-year-old mayor took a white handkerchief, tied it to his cane, and ran into the streets of the city hoping to quell the violence. As U.S. troops advanced into the streets of Nogales, Sonora, from their position across the line, President Penalzola pleaded with the angry Nogales to put down their weapons, despite later accounts to the contrary by U.S. military personnel, including Lieutenant Herman. Uh, a U.S. official noted from the U.S. consulate in Nogales, Sonora, confirmed that a shot fired from the Arizona side felled the Mexican mayor. The mortally wounded Penalzola Penel was dragged into a nearby pharmacy where nothing could be done to save him. He died about a half hour later. Now, with the death of Mayor Penal Oza, Nogales Sonaros officials, realizing the carnage must stop, agreed to raise a white flag from the Mexican Custom House. It was now about 7.45 p.m. The fighting had been going on for approximately 3 hours and 30 minutes. Seeing the white flag, Colonel Herman ordered a ceasefire. Now, though wounded in the thigh, Colonel Herman, along with his aide, Lieutenant Fannin, and the American Consul met with the Mexican officials on the Mexican side of International Street. Now, Lieutenant Fannin recounted the meeting in a 72 letter to his son. Quote, I remember distinctly that while this conference was going on, a sniper's bullet cut off a small limb of a tree that fell pretty close to me, and I felt like diving into a big ditch that was close to us. Makes sense. Now, at this conference, the American Consul asked Herman what he wanted said to the Mexicans. Colonel Herman replied, tell them to gather all of their forces and surrender them to me within 30 minutes, end quote. The American Consul demurred, stating that the Mexican authorities could not gather together all of the people 
who were doing the shooting. Now the only shooting that was then occurring was some sniping and it was agreed that both sides would attempt to stop their forces from any further sniping. The website Cacti35 states snipers on both sides continued shooting for a while after the ceasefire but were eventually silenced by the efforts of their leaders on both sides. As a tenuous and suspicious peace fell on the border community, sporadic rifle fire shots were heard throughout the night, causing many to fear further violence. Subsequently, many of the non-combatants in Nogales, Sonora fled south. The international border in this important port of entry remained closed until the late the next day. The fight was over, the wounded were cared for, and the dead were totaled. Depending on the sources used, casualties differed slightly. The website Cacti35 states Mexican casualties were 125, 28 to 30 in Mexican uniforms, killed and 300 wounded. Found among the Mexican dead were allegedly two German agents. Allegedly. Of the 95 Mexican civilians killed, the two border guards on duty that day lost their lives. Cecina Madrid and Francisco Gallegos. Those two men are considered national heroes in Mexico, as they should be. On the American side, one civilian, Gaston Redock, a customs guard, age 20. The U.S. Army had two killed, three severely wounded, and 15 slightly wounded. Now, the end result of this battle was the permanent placement of a border wall down the middle of International Street forever separating the two Nogaleses. Another lasting effect of this incident is a sense of injustice perpetrated on the Mexican people of Nogales, Sonora by the arrogant Americans. So what is the takeaway from this incident? Well, if you ever find yourself the mayor of a small border town and a full-fledged battle breaks out, a white flag on the end of a cane is not a guarantee that you will not be shot. Play it safe. Stick the white flag out of a window and wait for the bullets to stop flying before you venture out to make peace. This is our history. This is our heritage. You know, I would like to thank you for watching. And if you enjoyed this video, hit the thumbs up button, subscribe to my channel, and ring the bell. Please, leave a comment below. The exchange of thoughts and theories and new evidence is always welcome.